floor is yours, Paul. I'm very much looking forward to your talk. We see your screen, we see your video, we hear your audio, everything fine. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, Robert, for this introduction. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Paul, and I'm working in the infrared and Raman spectroscopy group at Recent. Uh, Robert just uh, briefly introduced Recent already, so I won't say much more here. Um, except that I'm from the Infrared and Raman Spectroscopy Group, where we are interested in bringing new infrared and Raman technology from the lab into uh, the industrial environment. So let's start, just start into the into the topic. Um, what is infrared spectroscopy? Um, when we look at the electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation. Um, it is right uh, situated between the visible and the terahertz wavelengths uh, ranges. So starting um, from the really near infrared at 800 nanometers until to 2.5 microns, we usually say this is the near infrared region. And then from 2.5 to about 20 or so microns, we have the mid infrared and then after that, the far infrared region. And today I will be mainly focusing about the near infrared, but also we'll talk a little bit, little bit about mid infrared as well. Um, so in infrared spectroscopy, we are interested in measuring molecular absorptions. So if uh, molecules are um, interacting with infrared radiation, they absorb this radiation at specific um, um, wavelengths. So this is dependent on the molecular composition of the molecule. So if you have a lot of CH bonds, for example, uh, then you get specific, uh, so that this molecule will absorb specific parts of the infrared radiation. And this is uh, also known as the, the fingerprint of the of this molecule. And here, for example, what can we measure with infrared spectroscopy? We can measure gases, plastics, resins, glues, water, but also biological material, of course. Um, mainly, to be to to to, to be precise, um, we can measure non-pure materials quite well with infrared uh, spectroscopy. And here, just for an example, um, this is the near infrared spectrum of water. Um, you can see here the wavelengths uh, from thousands uh, to two and a half thousand nanometers. And here and here we have uh, these specific absorption uh, 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 bands that I was just talking about. And this is just uh, the infrared hits the water, infrared light. And then these vibrations in the water molecules are uh, induced. And this, of course, needs some energy. And this energy is taken out of the, of the infrared uh, broadband light. And you can see this here by these absorption uh, bands. Um, in the, I just want to mention a few differences between mid-infrared and near-infrared. Um, in the near-infrared, we can usually use quite common detectors, sometimes uh, still silicon-based detectors, but usually indium and gallium-based detectors. We can use standard uh, glasses uh, to measure through and just normal uh, light sources that are easily available, such as uh, halogen light sources. And in the mid-infrared, um, we need already specialized detectors, which are oftentimes have to be cooled and are not so sensitive anymore and not so widely available. And we have to use specific uh, glasses which are transparent for uh, mid-infrared light and also specific light sources because with normal um, halogen lamps, um, they usually stop uh, emitting somewhere around this uh, wavelength range here. But of course, in the mid infrared range, um, we are more uh, specific. Um, we can measure directly the fundamental molecular vibrations, which makes the uh, identification of the molecules easier. 
And in the near infrared, we have usually overtones and combination vibrations, uh, which is why we need a really advanced um, data um, analysis in this uh, uh, wavelength range. But on the other hand, of course, the detectors are more sensitive and usually the systems are really rugged and also quite compact oftentimes. So it's always a matter of the application that we are confronted with, uh, with uh, which of the two uh, modalities uh, we want to use. So how can we measure infrared radiation? I just want to mention the three very basic uh, methodologies that are, or, or I mean, systems or uh, that that are available here. Um, of course, there are many more, but I'm just mentioning these three here now, right now. Um, first of all, dispersive spectrometers. Um, usually, you have some broadband infrared radiation and some dispersive element, uh, which, uh, depending on the wavelength, uh, the, deflects the, the light. And then we have an array detector, which where each pixel measures a different wavelength of the infrared light. And here, with such kind of systems, it is possible to measure this entire spectrum at the same time. Of course, uh, with some certain limitations, you cannot measure the whole uh, mid infrared uh, range with such a system. It would be quite difficult. Um, fast measurements are possible. But here, some limitations exist as well. Um, we have usually a narrow entrance entrance slit in such a systems, which defines the spectral resolution. So the, the more resolution you want, the less light you're, uh, you're able to put through the system. Then second, I want to talk about uh, tunable filters. These are used usually so-called Fabri Perot filters, which are semi-transparent uh, mirrors where some broadband uh, radiation enters into this uh, so-called resonator. And due to the distance of these two mirrors, only specific wavelengths are allowed to uh, pass um, this uh, resonator. This is due to, um, of course, um, interference effects, so uh, destructive and constructive interference. And by moving this one mirror relative to the other, we can scan through the infrared spectrum and measure at each uh, point with a point detector. This system uh, has the really high cost benefits. It's usually very cheap and also small. And you can design more as freely the spectral range in which such systems um, should work. But on the other hand, um, this spectral range is then quite narrow. This is a kind of drawback here, and the resolution is usually quite low, but for many industrial um, applications, which I will show later, um, the spectral resolution is actually not, not too important. And now, last but not least, I want to show maybe the most um, commonly known um, infrared spectrometer, which is the Fourier transform spectrometer. Here we have a uh, infrared broadband radiation entering the system, then it's split by a beam splitter uh, and reflected by those mirrors, and then uh, interfering at the beam splitter again and reflected through the detector. And um, we can, by scanning these mirrors, um, measure the so-called interferogram. And by um, um, applying a Fourier transform to this interferogram, we can retrieve the infrared spectrum and this system has the advantage that it covers a huge uh, spectral range compared to the other techniques. And we have a spectral multiplexing advantage, which makes it very well uh, suitable for the mid-infrared um, regime. Because here, as I mentioned before, we have usually um, weak signals and also detectors. And also this system offers usually a high spectral resolution. But uh, some minor drawbacks. It's usually relatively slow and also inflexible. With inflexible, I just mean that you always have to scan the whole uh, spectral range more or less. This is kind of an intrinsic feature of this instrument. Um, so now let me also talk a little bit about, about Raman spectroscopy. So in fact, uh, we already heard that it's an absorption phenomenon, but Raman scattering is, as the name already says, a scattering effect. Um, Usually it's done completely, so it's done in a way where you have a laser, um, 
monochromatic light source, uh, usually red or green or near infrared lasers that are uh, pointed at the Raman active sample. And what happens then is that the sample transmits or reflects uh, most of the part of the laser, but small parts of the laser radiation are shifted uh, towards uh, lower frequencies. There's also another Raman modality where it's shifted towards higher frequencies, but we are not considering that now. And this shift is more or less uh, corresponding to fundamental molecular vibrations. So more or less, we are measuring something with a, vis with a visible laser um, that resembles something from the mid-infrared uh, region, which is quite interesting. And you can imagine that this uh, uh, we can use here the highly sensitive detectors from the visible and near-infrared range. And the spectrometer here, what that is usually used is the first type that I described just before. So it's usually a dispersive spectrometer. Um, now we might think, uh, wow, uh, we can measure infrared information with a visible laser. Why don't we just do um, Raman all the time? Um, this is because um, uh, infrared and Raman spectroscopy are complementary techniques. So molecules that are sensitive for or that are Raman active are oftentimes not uh, active in the infrared regime. So because the, the Raman effect works for homonuclear uh, bonds and the infrared effect uh, uh, absorption uh, works for polar bonds. So something like CH bonds or uh, OH bonds, they are usually infrared uh, or they are infrared active. And CC or OO bonds, for example, are Raman active. Uh, and also, of course, another, another uh, uh, objection that speaks uh, often against Raman spectroscopy is because you have to have a laser, which is sometimes also in the industrial environment. Uh, people want to avoid uh, having a laser somewhere in a, in a production facility. Because you need certain, of course, uh, you need to wear glasses or whatever you need to block the radiation somehow. Now let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, near infrared and Raman spectroscopy in process analytical technology. Um, this is already a, a very uh, popular and already hugely grown field. Um, the measurements in processes can be done for many different uh, materials and chemicals. And by intelligent uh, data analysis, uh, we can analyze uh, really a lot of things, uh, measure concentrations and so on. And the good thing about this is that uh, the measurements are usually, usually uh, in real time. So Often in some processes, there are samples drawn every two hours or every five hours or whatever, but here we can measure in real time. And mostly it's also contactless, but in contact measurements, of course, are possible as well. And the, the thing why uh, Mir and Raman is so um, successful in the PAT applications is because they are compatible with uh, fiber optics. So this means you can you can attach a glass fiber to your spectrometer and really put the measurement probe directly into your process. And in the recent years, so since I started at recent uh, five or six years ago, um, the spectrometers have continued to become smaller and smaller. So really to a point where they fit just uh, to the palm of your hand or even to a fingertip and the prices went down um, consistently. Um, and due to the fact that these products are designed now in a way that they are very small, they are utilizing the so-called uh, micro electromechanical uh, components, this makes them very rugged. So this means that they are really well suited for uh, environments where there are adverse uh, conditions. And at recent, we have um, currently more than 15 uh, different kinds of infrared and uh, trauma spectrometers available. And depending on the 
on the on the application that the industrial customers are interested in we choose the composition of the correct light source spectrometer data analysis and and builds a kind of of package out of that uh, which is tailored uh, to the to the specific application um and now i really want to show some results um from some uh, projects in the industrial environment and first uh, i will show a project that was done with uh, metadonia group um, i think there are people also from from this company um, present now uh, they are an austrian uh, resin manufacturer and what recent did here uh, was uh, we developed a near infrared based inline process control uh, in uh, melamine and phenol formaldehyde resin batch production. And how that works, you can see it here. So the microspectrometer was introduced somewhere in the, into the product stream uh, via an immersion probe and a fiber, as I just mentioned before. And then some calibration uh, measurements were done in order to calibrate the system on the expected uh, to the expected values then that can uh, appear in this process and then we started with the inline measurements and the interesting thing that you can see here here is the uh, concentration plotted against the uh, um, time more or less so this is over the course of uh, several days as you can see here and the blue line is the continuous uh, concentration value output of the near infrared uh, system and the yellow dots are the manually drawn um, reference measurements so each couple of hours some worker in the factory uh, drew a sample and measured the, the concentration and the, then these two uh, data sets were overlaying here, and you can see they they fit quite well to each other, also for the second reactor. And by this method, it is possible for to reduce uh, the uh, offline wet chemical measurements by over ninety percent, and the savings are estimated to be uh, around uh, two hundred thousand euros per year. And of course, also the working conditions. Uh, kind of improved because uh, workers are less exposed to potentially uh, dangerous uh, materials. Another example that I want to show is uh, moisture monitoring, which is getting really popular now um, due to the fact that uh, energy prices uh, skyrocketed and also this uh, minor uh, climate change thing that is going on. Uh, it becomes more and more interesting for companies to uh, control their drying processes uh, really to a point where they are able to dry a product only really to the point where it's uh, it's as dry as they want it to. Because nowadays in many, many of the industries, some experienced um, um, person or technician is deciding when to stop the drying, but usually they are over drying the product. And with near infrared spectroscopy, um, the water band, uh, as I showed in the beginning, can be measured quite precisely, which is, of course, an indicator of how dry a product is. And we did that here uh, for the company Fisher hold um, for starch derived products, but also for dumpling bread. You can see here the reference measurements that we did in a lab simulation of our conveyor belt. Um, and you can see the results fit again quite well. So we measured here moisture contents, in this case from four to 22%, and here from zero to uh, six or 5%. And this was more or less a case study, and we are at the moment um, developing the final customer specific inline uh, sensor for uh, Fisher Pold. And I also wanted to show a Raman example where we have a really nice and successful um, inline uh, solution running, but due to um, uh, 
NDA reasons. Uh, I cannot show it here. So I decided to show another really nice project that we did uh, with first and test, uh, which was an in situ Raman measurement of, of steel corrosion. Therefore, so we put a steel plate into a salt fog chamber and inserted the Raman spectrometer more or less directly into this chamber. And then several salt fog uh, and drying phases were run over the course of eight days. And we were continuously uh, collecting uh, Raman spectra. And then we evaluated the whole data and we saw that we could see uh, pretty nicely the chemical transitions during the corrosion cycles. So you can see, for example, here the transitions in the first in the, in the salt fog, fog phase and drying phases um, of this uh, good tight uh, material here, or for example, here the hematite, um, which was quite interesting for the colleagues of uh, first and test. And this just only is works as an illust illustrative uh, purpose here because I couldn't show them the inline. Um, solution that we had, but it should show really that uh, Raman is very powerful and for inline processes it's especially and um, even for really harsh conditions like here, it was in a salt fog uh, chamber and the system doesn't really care about it, so it's, it still works quite well. So this brings me already to the summary my talk um i want to just uh, repeat that uh, infrared and raman spectroscopy are complementary but both non-destructive uh, methods of course uh, for chemical analysis uh, we can really measure all kinds of different types of, of chemicals and biological samples um, contactless measurements are possible but also of course in contact measurements in real time this makes uh, Raman and infrared spectroscopy really interesting for PET applications and also the miniaturization over the last years really uh, led to a strong cost reduction without also significant drawbacks in performance, which are also I think showcased. And at recent we have several different uh, systems available, depending really on the application. Um, we can choose from a wide range of light sources, spectrometers, data um, evaluation algorithms in order to fit the needs of the specific um, um, industrial application type. And I want to thank also the whole infrared and Raman group at recent, and of course the external partners and the funding agencies. Uh, thank you very much. So on our side to thank you for the talk, for the overview. Thanks a lot, Paul.